Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're very welcome to this evening's lecture. Uh, my name is Ronan Keane. I'm the chair of Engineers Ireland Cork Region. And uh, tonight's lecture is the Lockery Technology Cluster Study, um, which is part of the National um, Sustainability Grand Tour series. So our speaker this evening is uh, Dr. John Handley of FDT Consulting Engineers. Uh, John is a Roscommon native, so he has both personal and professional interests in the uh, technology cluster study. Uh, John is the managing director of FTT, and among other qualifications, he has a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering. So he has extensive experience in the technical aspects of project engineering across various process and utility plants in the manufacturing uh, sector and most notably in the brewing, brewing industry. Uh, so he's also fulfilled the, the role of energy efficient design export across several large projects in the pharmaceutical, brewing, packaging, freight, dairy, data center and medical device sectors. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite John to start his presentation. Just unmute there, John. Sorry, Ronan. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I'll get kicked off here. So uh, just at the outset, um, I have a good bit to cover tonight and hopefully time will work in my favor. Um, just at the outset, um, I'd like to say there's a good bit of detail in some parts of, of the presentation and just because of time pressures, probably won't get into everything in the level of detail that ideally we'd, we'd, we'd like to do. But if anybody has any questions um, afterwards, in, um, where they want to talk about any of the subjects in detail, they can by all means get in touch and uh, we can we can have a discussion. Um, the this, the presentation tonight is in relation to uh, the Lockery Technology Cluster Study. This is a piece of work that FTT have been uh, commissioned to do by uh, the Depar Department of Climate Change and Environment. Uh, the study has been funded as part of the Just Transition Fund, which was announced back in. Um, June of 2020, and uh, this study, once the funding was awarded, um, kicked off um, in October of last year. Uh, so I'll start by giving a little bit of background and context, maybe some regional context, um, as well as some personal and professional, um, following on from that. So um, in terms of the background, I'll start with peak power generation. Uh, the impacts of the cessation of, of peat power generation, the just transition process, and some of, some of the drivers for this study. So, in terms of peat power generation, um, this study is focusing really in the Lockery region, where Lockery power, pl power plant would be uh, located in the town of Lanesborough. Uh, uh, there's a sister plant in Shannon Bridge and Offaly, um, and both both plants would have used peat as their primary source of fuel for. For generating electricity, um, as you can see in the slide here, you know peat power generation has been kind of ongoing in the state probably since since the early 1950s, um, and the plants in Lanesford Shannon Bridge were powered a significant number of homes over their um, over their history. Uh, the Lockery Power Plant, um, the most recent um, version of the power station, you can see it um, here in the bottom, uh, that ceased power generation at the end of 2020. Um, it was the fourth incarnation. The first unit went in in 1958. It was 20 megawatts. The last one in 2002 was five times that size at 100 megawatts. Um, burned peat generating steam. Steam in turn generated electricity uh, with a, an approximate conversion efficiency of 37%. Um, it's estimated to be the largest structure ever built in County Lanford. Um, also on the site, the, the power plant feeds into a 110 kV transmission station. Um, and this transmission station, you can see it there, is located on the same site. Um, the generator feeds into that transmission station, and then there's a number of 110 kV lines which feed um, various parts of the region, um, heading off to feed power at Lone, Longford, Bullegar. Um, also, there's a number of um, lines, one existing that's feeding uh, Sheep on Wind Farm, feeds into it, the 54 megawatt wind farm, and then the, uh, there's a future plans to installed Duryad Wind Farm, which is uh, recently awarded planning permission. Um, and that's also nearby in the region. In terms of Bornemona, um, Bornemona 
long-standing presence in the in the region as well, right from from its inception. Um, Bora and Mora are a substantial landowner nationally. You can see there uh, 80,000 hectares of land, and 130 individual bogs. Um, they have a large bespoke rail network, um, which up until the, the end of power, peat power generation would have um, delivered the harvest of peat to the power plants um, and also have taken away the, the ash from the, from the combustion process. Um, so moving on, um, in terms of the impacts of cessation, so like I've said, uh, power generation finished at the end of December 20, 2020. Um, there's been a number of impacts from that, both positive and negative. I've shown some samples there of some of the media reports. Some of the positive ones are environmental impacts in terms of the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the, um, the improvement in air quality, um, you know, it was a, an industry that always would have required a level of subsidization from their taxpayer. Um, um, so, you know, those burdens on the state are, are gone and that's, that's potentially a good thing. But on the other hand, there's negatives associated with brain drain from the region. Um, there's a lot of secondary and induced employment that would have come from, from, the, uh, from the economic enterprises. Um, seasonal employment, all of, all of that has potentially dried up. And in, in recent weeks, you can see uh, reports in the media about the Irish peat moss industry, and that supply chain has been severely impacted to the extent that they're looking at importing peat moss from uh, other, other countries. Um, the just transition process kicked off um, shortly after the announcement of the plant closures in, in August 2019. Um, the whole history of just transition dates back to the 1970s in the US. It was actually from the atomic industry where a number of nuclear power plants were shut down and the unions um, looked to secure um, better outcomes for their workers as, as, as part of that process. And that continued into the fossil fuel industry in the 1990s and, and in recent decades. Um, in at the end of 2019, Kira Mulvey was uh, appointed by Minister Bruton as the Just Transition Commissioner. He undertook a, a long engagement process over a number of months, which was unfortunately slightly interrupted by, 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 by the pandemic, but uh, he met a lot of stakeholders in the region and uh, produced his first report in May 2020, which the Just Transition Fund followed on from. Um, in terms of Just Transition as a process, I've shown a map of the Midlands there, kind of showing showing the area that we're looking at, but in terms of just transition, it also includes Tipperary, Galway, Kildare um, as being impacted areas. Um, I've also included who are the, um, sorry, I'll just go back here. The, in terms of the various stakeholders and uh, parties involved in the strategy development and the implementation of just transition, you can see it's, it's, it's varied and there's, um, you know, quite a level of, complexity associated with the whole process and multiple stakeholders, all with all with legitimate interests. Um, in terms of uh, some positive developments, there was the announcement from Governor Bordemont about the Peatlands Restoration Plan at the tail end of 2020. Um, and that was followed then at the at the end of last year with the Herbrand closure. Um, and then there are the various funding schemes that have been put in place as, as part of this. So in terms of what the region has, natural assets, I suppose there's, there's a number of things. There's the boglands now will be used for sequestering carbon. There's renewable resource in the, in the region, like I said, in terms of wind power. Um, there's potential for solar, there's potential for bioenergy. Um, I might go into some, some, of, some of those things later on. The River Shannon is a, is a natural resource. Other, other um, aspects of the region that are potentially to its advantage. It's a central geographical region. It's effectively in the center of the island of Ireland. Um, there's a low population density, which you know has positives and negatives. In terms of positives, there, it means that there's potentially large amounts of land for, for potential development or, or for use in other activities. And there's an agricultural contracting workforce. Um, subset of that workforce would be seasonal workers in Bourne and which you mentioned. Um, and also of note is the Border Motor Rail Network, which I spoke about earlier, it's, which is quite extensive. Um, and it's something that probably should be considered in the, in the context of the next steps, that it's not uh, immediately written off as an asset because it may prove to have some value. 
Um, in terms of regional renewables, then I think I mentioned the wind farms. So there's 54 megawatts of wind power um, on the Roscommon um, side of the River Shannon, 54 megawatts of, of capacity. Um, Duryad wind farm is planned for construction um, in, the, in the coming years. Um, it's planned to be 96 megawatt of, of electricity, and they're both feeding into Lanes Row 110 kV transmission station. Um, that capacity of that has been, been upgraded as well. Um, in terms of the drivers for this study, I suppose before I get into the drivers, you can see the objectives that we're, we're trying to achieve, the impacts and outcomes we'd like to, to happen, and you know, ideally the outputs. You know, uh, that's that's what would be great to see coming out of the study. It's it's subject to a, a lot of um, mitigate, mitigating factors could could impact the success. Hopefully, it all all, all works out positively. Um, before we get into 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 all of that, though, it's probably worth asking what's a technology cluster because it's. Um, the term that, that gets widely used, but it's not um, very precisely defined. Um, it can be said as any group of businesses with something in common and links to an educational institution. So you, they're usually but not always geographically close to one another, and they're um, usually but not always a similar type of industry. Um, in terms of my personal motivation, um, Ronan alluded to it at the start of the uh, at the start of the talk. Um, I'm a native of Ballyleague, which is a village on the Roscommon side of the River Shannon. Um, I would have grown up in the town of Lanesborough and been educated there. And uh, the uh, Board of Mona and ESB and all the activities activities associated with that would have been very much part of the fabric of, of life growing up in that community. Um, my family have a number of businesses in the area as well, one of which is the marina, which is directly across from the power plant in Lanesborough. Um, so um, quite used to looking out the window and seeing the power plant out the, looking, looking back at me. Um, so I suppose it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future with, with the site. Um, when the announcements were made back in 2019, I, I came up with a couple of proposals, which I sent on to government and also discussed with uh, Kieran Mulvey as part of his engagement process um, in early 2020. Um, so my, my primary motivation is to see if the just transition process can bring, can bring improved long-term uh, economic, environmental and social outcomes um, for the region of Lockery, but also the surrounding areas. And, Potentially, the other the other um, areas impacted by just transition. A lot of what I'm talking about here, hopefully, is replicable for other areas. Um, why are FTT doing this, and why do I think we're a good fit? Aside from the personal aspects of this, um, uh, FTT are a consultancy uh, made up of a, uh, pr predominantly engineers, but also some scientists, uh, mechanical uh, and chemical engineers, predominantly. Um, the culture within the company is uh, very much collaborative, so we would um, work collaborative, collaboratively on a number of projects. Um, uh, there's a relatively flat structure in the company that, that you know, uh, encourages that, and uh, it typically uh, results in um, some innovative approaches to projects and, and also, you know, many different points of view being, being um, tabled and considered on, on projects. Um, so we have focus areas in sustainability, uh, project services and process support and continuous improvement. Where I think we're a good fit for this study is probably there's a lot of potential um, in the in the research sector. Um, and then there's, you know, in terms of entrepreneurs and businesses looking to set up um, our expertise and helping companies scale up their production processes allow us to maybe be a bridge um, between between research and, uh, and business. Um, so that's the background, the context, I suppose. In terms of the study itself, um, there are a number of work streams associated with the study and there's a, quite a lot of collaboration um, involved as well with the work we're doing. Um, before I get into the work streams, maybe in terms of support, just to kind of show um, who's involved, who have we been collaborating with and who are we consulting as, a, as, part, of the, as part of the study. So from a partnering, partnering point of view, we've got a number of partners, anyway, Galway, um, Vega Magoo, a Danish consultancy. Um, in terms of um, uh, research support, we have Biorvic, uh, who have got ties to UCD and the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group with ties to IT3, the Dock Institute of Technology, then JE Engineering and O'Brien Energy Consulting, um, who are helping out on, on, on engineering support as well. And also the community, we're quite uh, working quite closely with the community in Lanesborough and Bally League and sharing ideas and getting feedback there. That's a that's a very important aspect of this for me is to make sure that we're, whatever we come up with, that there's there's buy-in from the community. Um, 
that's that that's key. In terms of collaboration, we're working. You can see the the, the bodies were collaborating there. The one I'm going to call out in particular is Longford County Council. We've been um, working well and checking in regularly with the with the council. Um, the council were um, awarded funding as part of Just Transition to carry out an anaerobic digestion feasibility study for for the Lanesborough area and. Um, some of the outputs of our work hopefully will feed into their study and add value to it. Um, we're working together to make sure we can both achieve the maximum um, benefits from, from both studies. Um, and then in terms of consultation, probably for the best part of um, uh, 12 months, we've been consulting with a number of bodies. I won't go, go into them name by, name by name, but you can see there in terms of the breadth and uh, uh, the breadth of contact we've We've made with both regional stakeholders and also kind of looking outside of that as well. Um, in terms of our activity, um, so as I mentioned, we've got eight individual work streams. There's an overall uh, symbiosis work stream, which is looking at where there's opportunities within works one in one particular work stream, which may also feed into another to maximise the benefit of that. Um, we've got engineers so you can see the structure here there's a lead for every work stream and then they've, there's a number of support resources who are helping them deliver on that work stream external supports other supports you can help out we've called out the key stakeholders as well as any other stakeholders um who who may uh, uh may may be feeding into the study um some have fed in already some we will be making contact with as we kind of put more um detail around some of the feasibility um opportunities um, so we've got overall symbiosis, energy storage, there's a manufacturing work stream, we're looking at agricultural bioeconomy, aquatic or freshwater bioeconomy. There's a hydrogen study, which we've got a lot of support from NUI Galway are leading that, uh, Dr. Rory Monaghan's team are, are helping us out and, and doing most of the heavy lifting on that. We've got a renewable heating work stream and also a community integration work stream, which is, which is quite important as well. Um, in terms of how all these work together, so you can see um, the five, uh, if you want to call it ideation work streams, uh, agricultural, freshwater, energy storage, renewable heating and hydrogen. They take inputs from the various collaborators who are working with us, but also as part of the consultation process, we get inputs from any, any key stakeholders or knowledge leaders in any particular, um, any, any particular subject. Those ideas are shared on a two weekly basis um, with all the work stream leaders to make sure that there's idea sharing across work streams and any enablers that help one idea progress are identified. Um, they subsequently feed into the manufacturing work stream, which looks at what would this, what would this particular idea look like where it's scaled up to be uh, an economic activity. Um, so coming out of that, then there's defined technical requirements. If, if the idea hasn't been recycled or needs further recycling. If it has defined technical requirements, then it moves on for further assessment as part of the technic, technical cluster. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the bulk of this presentation is really around the idea generation stage of the, of the study. That's the point in time we're at at the moment where we've collected our ideas and we're about to embark on uh, detailed feasibility for um, for those ideas, whichever ones may turn out to be uh, having the highest likelihood of success. So I'm going to start with maybe ideas that we've maybe discounted, maybe a, an unfair term, but these are the ideas that we think maybe have less potential than others at the moment. Um, so for, for various reasons, um, these have all been ruled out uh, to, today. Some of them may be resurrected, but as things stand, this, this is where they are. Fish farming for for reasons that I'll get into when we talk about the aquatic bioeconomy study. Data centers, probably because of the strength of fiber in the region, while there are strong grid connections there, that's a potential blocker. Doesn't mean to say that couldn't change, but that's it at the moment. Um, I think we haven't come to any different conclusions than those the ESP or Board of Mono would have come to in terms of large scale generation from biomass. Anything requiring large amounts of natural gas as, as, a, as, a, as a means of providing Thermal energy has been discounted um, based on our understanding of government policy and investment in, in the fossil fuel infrastructure, um, both regionally and nationally. And heat extraction from the River Shannon um, looks very marginal, marginal as well. Um, <clears throat> moving on then, I suppose in terms of the first work stream was looking at energy storage. 
one of the areas we're looking at is um, long duration energy storage. This is one of the first ideas I would have had when I heard the power plant was, uh, was shutting down. Um, it's probably worth considering that, um, you know, when, 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 the, when the P plant shut down at the end of 2020, a number of people, you may have known in the media, uh, that there was some amber alerts on the grid, um, which was due to a combination of um, large assets being out for maintenance reasons and the P plants having shut off at that time, uh, uh, which happened at the same time, unfortunately, as a period of low wind. Um, so in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of low wind situations like that and amber alerts, that's that's one side. The flip side to that coin is there are times of the day where there is excess renewable electricity on the grid, um, known as curtailment. You can see uh, the figure here. I've uh, this is some work that was done by Paul Blount and uh, and uh, which was presented uh, in 2019 at an engineers engineers Ireland lecture looking at uh, managing curtailment in the grid. So you can see there's periods of the day typically where this. Uh, Black dashed line is a is a period of curtailment. Um, so in in those situations, the wind power um, can't be exported into interconnectors, and and wind farms are potentially turned off in that scenario. Um, so this work stream is looking at the potential for long duration energy storage in the grid as opposed to short duration. As part of that, we've we've looked at um, studies you know, from a from a wide wide range of sources. Um, the graphic here is kind of built on some work that was done by uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, their Office of Fossil Energy, um, back in 2020, where they where they compared a number of different technologies. Um, so you can see ranging from from pumped hydro down to methanol, and uh, various um, technologies in between. So um, these were all assessed more or less with an equal weighting against these criteria. And um, there's, there's, I've applied just a ranking just to kind of show which ones come out on top. So Based on that report um, and on, on other work, it looked like lithium-ion batteries and liquid air came out as uh, as, as very good uh, very good fits. What we've done with the work here is we've overlaid um, a regional lens on it, where we say, well, what's the suitability of this technology um, to the region? Does it provide additional economic benefits in terms of induced or secondary employment, um, or as well as that, the, the the primary employment from the technology itself? Um, and thirdly, does it enable other industries? The interesting thing when you put the regional overlay on it is it, it um, moves lithium ion down a little bit and liquid air uh, goes, retains its position as number one, followed by hydrogen or some variants on hydrogen. Um, liquid air comes out on top. Um, the the uh, US Department of Energy report um, came to the conclusion that it, the, the reasons for that is it's, it's a, it uses proven technology. Um, it has the in ability to integrate with thermal plants um, through the use of steam-driven compressors and heat integration. Um, it limits storage media requirements, um, and it's also ready for immediate deployment. Um, it, in particular, it looks like a good, um, a good technology to install beside wind farms. So basically, the technology works on the, on the premise of taking in curtailed electricity, um, compressing and liquefying that, that, that air, storing it in cryogenic tanks, um, using the heat of compression that you've used to compress that air and storing that. And then when you need to um, uh, convert, convert uh, the stored energy back into electricity, you, you use your stored heat to um, gasify the air and expand it quickly and generate the electricity on that basis. Um, so this is something that I believe should be, should be looked at for, for, for the region. Um, it has, a, I think it has potential to go in beside maybe wind 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 farms, but also maybe on some some other locations, particularly if there's a decent source of um, waste heat from from the plants, which can be uh, in the range of 80 degrees Celsius. Um, apologies, has come out of this. Um, the next one we looked at is hydrogen. So as I mentioned, hydrogen. Um, this hydrogen study was something that was looked at by NUI Galway. I've, I've driven this. Um, so why have we looked at hydrogen? I suppose as a fuel, the advantage with hydrogen is there's no emissions at point of use. Um, in terms of producing hydrogen in the region, um, what we're looking at as part of the work here is determining if we can use the existing infrastructure and expertise in the region. There's several potentially suitable grid connections. So 
I mentioned at the start of the presentation, there's a lot of big power plants, but we also have all the wind farm connections in the area. And, and by virtue of the fact that we have multiple 110 kV lines coming into Lockery Power, there's there's potential in the region for for maybe locating um, hydrogen electrolyzers there. Um, so in in that instance, you could make um, hydrogen from the renewable electricity from from the local wind farms. Um, so as you can see in the slide here, um, we have looked at a number of different scenarios, um, both in 2030 and 2050. So we looked at three scenarios for 2030, looking at transport, industrial heat, and grid, grid injection. So taking um, transport firstly, um, we've looked at transport because there's a significant haulage industry in the region. There's numerous fleets of different sizes located near, near Lanesboro. Um, a good example is DPD in Athlone. They have a truck and fleet of over 120 trucks um, in, a, in Athlone town. Um, many trucks are suitable or unsuitable for electrification um, through batteries because of high mileage, high payload, or a busy schedule. So hydrogen is potentially uh, a good fit for these. Um, in terms of industrial boilers um, and industrial heat, the reason that's been looked at is there's, you know, there's, there's a number of large industries in Roscommon and Longford who don't have access to the, the natural gas grid and they are reliant on dirty fuels such as heavy fuel oil. So hydrogen could supply heat for sites and processes unsuitable for, for electrification or biomass. And it's probably important to call out there that really what we're looking at there is high temperature users, um, not really anything using heat under 100 degrees Celsius that can be done more efficiently and I'll go with that um, in subsequent slides. And then finally, grid injection. Um, the reason for that is hydrogen can decarbonize heating by displacing natural gas use. Um, and the advantage uh, for maybe Lanesboro as a region, we can look here. Um, we've got major urban centers here, but we have the gas grid. Um, there's a, a rough mock up here showing the gas, um, the high pressure gas being going to it loan, but there's a spur off that feeds uh, uh, center parks in near, near, near Ballymahan town, which is approximately 25 kilometers away from uh, from, from Lanesboro. Um, so um, going back into, into these scenarios, this is looking at uh, producing and compressing hydrogen at Lanesboro and then trucking it in tube trailers to the demand location. Um, why would we select uh, the Lockery area for, for, for hydrogen? I mentioned the, uh, the electrical grid infrastructure and the wind resource. There's also skilled workforce in the area with energy industry experience. Um, it's probably worth noting that you know um, the grid infrastructure at, at a level below 110 kV has limitations, and there are going to be instances where poor building stock could limit electrification potential. Um, I call out the proximity to the to the number of urban centres there that are within uh, transportation distance: Longford, Alone, Bullingar, um, Roscommon. Um, and there's the air quality benefits as well from using hydrogen as a fuel. Um, um, some of the cons, we should call them out. Uh, you know, there's no large potential demand centers and no port for export. Um, and there's no geological storage potential, but um, the, uh, the scenario assessment has shown that hydrogen does have potential for the region. The levelized cost of hydrogen for, um, for transport here. Now, this is the production cost. It doesn't exclude transportation, injection or dispensing. For taxes, but um, at between three euros two cents and three euros sixteen cents for a levelized cost of hydrogen um, in, the, in the low scenario, that's roughly equivalent to about seventy one cent per liter of diesel. Just to just to frame that in uh, in more uh, in terms maybe more of us are familiar with. Um, looking at twenty fifty continues the analysis, but instead of looking at um, a limited number of trucks, it expands that out. I forgot to mention for the industrial heat scenario there in, in the 2030, you looked at 20% of the large industries in the, in the area using hydrogen. This 2050 scenario looks at 100% and what that would look like. And also in terms of the avoided greenhouse gas emissions from, from a change like this. Um, so then moving on quickly to, uh, to the next work stream, um, taking a, a move away from energy is looking at the agricultural bioeconomy. Um, this is an area we think has massive potential for the Midlands and, and, and the farming community, particularly if the boglands are, 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 are less available. Um, so we've looking at, we, we're, we've, we've looked at um, a number of things, sort of proven technologies, um, technologies that are uh, 
uh, emerging but are proven and have high potential and then te uh, technologies that are that are in the in the process of emerging so starting with proven technologies anaerobic digestion you can see i've called it out there as a challenging technology but it's worth saying it's an it's an enabler for pollution control it's a potential income stream for farmers if it was uh, if it was scaled up and if the networks worked uh, building on from the hydrogen work stream there's potential to couple the hydrogen possibly with anaerobic digestion for upgrading the quality of the biogas from, from anaerobic digestion. Um, and we're also looking at what the opportunities are for upcycling um, the digestate from, from, from anaerobic digestion for other potential uses. Um, as I mentioned, Longford County Council are embarking on a feasibility study and we'll be feeding our inputs into, into that. Um, moving on then to kind of high potential industries. Um, first one is looking at protein. Um, uh, mealworms is the example we've given here. There's good circular economy potential in this. It's a growth area. This is really in response to the global protein shortage and obviously the, the, the rising global human population. Um, proteins from, from insects could be used for filling this protein gap. So, you know, manufacturing protein for, for animals. Also, there was a recent EU ruling that some, some of these types of products are safe for human consumption, which opens the market up even more. Um, there's two kind of macro steps. There's the uh, farming and growing step followed by the processing step. And they're kind of shown there on the, on the slide in front of you. Um, different treatments have different consequences in terms of the, the product properties and uh, uh, textures and colors, et cetera. Um, and there is processing requirements for food safe, to ensure food safety and to ensure there's no chemical degradation. Um, the interesting thing about uh, mealworms, I suppose, is that uh, as, as, as a as a potential economic enterprise, it, it, it could be util, utilizer of um, nutrient rich waste streams, waste heat from other 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 enterprises. Um, it's worth also noting Hexafly and Navin are, are a, a business that are um, growing growing quickly and uh, producing products like this. Um, the next one there's a high potential. It's looking at um, it's looking at hemp CBD CBD production. So um, just to call out here, I suppose you know. Both fiber and dual hemp crops. There are some there are crops that can be grown using conventional farm machinery. Um, it's an area probably that Born and Mona have been looking at over the years. I, um, and there's been sort of anecdotal stories around that. I suppose the, the amount of land that's been sequestered now probably limits the, the land resource, which potentially could unlock it for um, for the agricultural community in the region. Um, it's a carbon negative crop. It can offset carbon emissions and taxes, you know, particularly if it's yeah, you know, insulation is one of the products that can be made for us. So you're basically storing the carbon. Um, it's most well known as a source of uh, cannabis oil, CBD, um, used as a pharmaceutical, um, new, um, and also in, as, a, as an ingredient. Um, that only utilizes the hemp flower and the leaf biomass, but other parts of the uh, other parts of the plant can be utilized. So it's estimated to be over fifty thousand different uses um, when it's considered as a raw um, production material. Um, some interesting research uh, is coming out of California at the moment, where the mulch from hemp has been, uh, the uh, the biomass from hemp has been used as uh, investigated to see if it can be used as mulch, um, which could be interesting if it's considered in the context of peat moss and, and, and potential alternatives to that. Um, in terms of emerging, in terms of emerging technologies, then um, what I'm showing here is uh, the biofinery gloss uh, technology. That is uh, being developed uh, by the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group, and they've recently uh, finished some trials there that have had promising results. Um, it's effectively a mobile biorefinery which collects grass from fields and uh, processes that um, in the farmyard into different fractions. So you can produce a press cake which is fed back to animals, and also the juices then from the grass go into other fractions. Um, high value products then from, from this process can be produced in a central biorefinery. Um, so the work is ongoing, it's promising results, uh, like I said, which have been published in recent weeks. That's something we're going to uh, continue to look at. Um, moving on then quickly to renewable heating. Um, I was conscious of time there, I'm going to try and uh, get, get moving pretty quickly. Uh, so in terms of renewable heating, uh, you can see um, in this graph, I'll just zoom out there a little bit, you can see these are the counties where they use a Substantial portion of the households use peat as the source for their central heating. 
Um, just looking here, you can see the just transition counties in terms of the proportion of heating that comes from oil or solid fuel is very high. You know, Longford, Offaly, Westmead, Roscommon, Leitrim, all over 75% of their heating comes from these sources. Um, whereas if you look at the quality of the, the housing stock in, in those areas, this is almost a, effectively a league table ranked by the A-rated homes. Um, you can see Dublin, Mead, Kildare, you know, the top of the table in terms of A-rated homes, whereas a number of the just transition counties are towards the, the other end. So that's, that presents a challenge in terms of electrification heat. Not insurmountable, but it's a challenge nonetheless. Um, so we're asking some key questions as part of the study. How will heating in rural Midlands homes be decarbonised? How will industry in the region decarbonise, particularly for higher temperature applications? That's an important point to make. And to what extent can the region become self-sufficient for its thermal energy needs? So starting with biomass, this cycle through here, um, something we're looking at is, 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 is biomass feasible for the region? Not in large scale for power generation, like I said at the start uh, earlier in the talk, but uh, um, for a local supply chain, potentially for industry and potentially for domestic use as well, depending on what comes out of that. Um, we, we have noted the, the public consultation on solid fuels that's out at the moment, and that, that will likely drive the direction of what happens next with this. Um, one opportunity we're looking at is around willow torrefaction. This is a process of modifying the properties of biomass by mild thermal conversion. Um, so it's effectively drying, drying the biomass, and that process increases the carbon content and net calorific value. Um, so you heat in the absence of oxygen to about 225 degrees Celsius for several minutes. Um, the benefits of doing that, you get higher energy density and less smoke from the fuel when it's thermally, uh, thermally converted. And uh, it, what's, what's of interest in, in the region in terms of Arigna biofuels operating in in, in a there's there's already capability in the region for this, so it's something that we're going to look at. Is there further opportunity there? Moving on to high temperature heating, I mentioned you know we're we're investigating that in terms of low carbon heat sources to meet high temperature requirements. This is my own subjective view, but in the short to medium term, if uh, we're not going to extend the fossil infrastructure, there's you're really looking at biomass and some biomethane. In the medium term, possibly biomethane with some hydrogen, and then in the longer term, as high temperature heat pumps technology becomes more commonplace, that should and probably will become part of the mix. Uh, finally, then in terms of domestic heating, this uh, another area we're going to look at um, is uh, uh, heat batteries potentially used in domestic settings, where if they were combined with heat pumps, what kind of benefit would they would they deliver relative to the, the status quo and also relative to deep retrofits with, um, with conventional heat pumps? Uh, fresh water bioeconomy then, moving on quickly. Um, I mentioned this before, I think earlier, uh, there's some limitations in the Lockery region in terms of developing enterprise in this, in this area because Lockery is a special protection area and a special area of conservation. Um, but from discussions with uh, Bordish Gawara, who developed uh, a fish farm on Bordemona land of Mount Lucas, there does look to be potential opportunity around growing duckweed, not as part of a fish um, fish farming enterprise, but feeding it again with nutrient rich waste streams to grow the duckweed, which could then be refined in a biorefinery to produce uh, um, protein. Um, so just moving on quickly. Um, in terms of symbiosis, then this is really the work that our colleagues vegan in Vegan Magoo are working on for us to look at where are the opportunities around symbiosis. So this calls out the ideal characteristics of technology clusters that have been seen in Denmark. Um, in terms of what we're looking at here, this is one, one such uh, campus in Denmark called Green Lab. It was established in a rural community as a public-private partnership. Um, there's several examples of this, and we're going to be working up uh, a pack on this, um, hopefully for a presentation to the uh, Midlands Regional Transition Team, probably in, in a number of weeks' time. Um, but this shows that it's been proven, it, it works, um, but it's, it's, it's important that um, for these type of enterprises that uh, the municipalities have to play a key role in establishing and sustaining these types of clusters. Um, so just moving on, uh, in terms of the region, the Loch Ree region, comparing it with what's in Denmark, I, I believe there's a lot of potential there. We've got many, um, positives. There's multiple strong grid connections. There's we still have the Border Mona rail network, which could have a lot of potential, potentially for some of the bioeconomy opportunities. Potentially also hydrogen as well as a, as a transport mechanism. 
that that remains to be seen. Um, relatively close to the to the gas grid in Ballymahan, um, and like I said at the start, we're kind of focused in on, on the region on the map here, but we we are. Our assessments will take in a broader geographical region depending on how feasible or how much uh, potential a given opportunity has. Um, so just this is, uh, I suppose, this is my idealized view of the potential of a technology cluster. Um, it's, uh, it shows the maximum potential, I suppose, in terms of what I think. Um, we've got the natural resources feeding in on the left here. We've got existing infrastructure and existing economic activities. And it's looking to see, can you build a technology cluster on top of what you have there? Um, I think it's important to say cooperative working structures and supports are, are key to, to, to the success of anything like this. And this isn't necessarily an engineering problem to solve. Um, it's a, probably a policy and a, a political problem. Um, and there's people better placed than me to, 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 to tackle those problems. Um, but it's probably worth saying it's, it's no different to probably what preceded um, preceded it in the region in terms of the peat industry would have been um, would have received support and uh, you know there would have been those kind of structures in place in the past. So just to uh, move on to the discussion, very quickly going to go through this. The next steps for the study, um, you can see them there. We're finalising our initial hydrogen feasibility study collecting the best in class technology cluster findings then over the next month we're looking to present our initial insights to the various interest groups um, followed on from that and getting feedback from all, all the key stakeholders we'll look to final move to final shortlisting of ideas and then move into high level technical and economic analysis of these ideas and then looking to ideally close things out then um, towards the third end of the third quarter of 2021 um, I think I've, I've alluded to this um, during the presentation. Driving change is probably this, there, there's there's a whole um, area to consider around um, you know bringing the community on board with, with with you and trying to grow a base and capability in the region. Um, so this is really just a question: How do we build regional capacity? How do we support those types of changes? How do we get a typical beef farmer in the region um, to move away from farming beef to maybe looking at hemp or willow or insect farming, for example, all, all, all three potential opportunities and probably more along with that. Um, then just in terms of an Engineers Ireland context is something I just wanted to kind of show, show this as a study for, for FTT as a company, um, it's been a really rewarding process. Um, we've got the majority of, of our staff are working on it in, in various guises. Um, two of our engineers have got started over the course of the study, which is really, really great to, great to hear. And um, the, uh, the other engineers who are growing their experience, they're, they're really um, growing their competencies in, the, in, in, in a number of the, the key competency areas as by, by virtue of doing this work. Um, so I'm just gonna finish off, I suppose, I, I have a call out on the slide there. There's probably, hopefully there's nobody I've missed, but they're, 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 if there is, I apologize in advance, but. Uh, I'd like to sincere thanks to everybody who's helped us get to this point with the study. Um, in particular, everybody on the FTT staff, a lot of people have kind of put in work and have really got engaged with it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to see um, as, as part of the management team of the business. So uh, yeah, I'll wrap up there. Apologies have gone over by five or six minutes, but um, I'll hand it back over to you there, now, Ronan, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. Um, you, 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 you weren't joking when you said you had a lot to get through. There's, um, you know, a, a lot of strands there and even, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, the, the kind of flow chart at the end, just trying to, to even fit everything that was, that was there into it, you know, um, very, very interesting. Um, Look, folks, um, I can see if there's a few questions come in. So if you want to use the Q&A button there at the um, at the bottom of your screens, uh, John, if you want to actually have a look at the questions as well, I, I'll, I'll call them out, but you can you can read through them. Um, so look, I might as well kick off there. Um, so uh, Brian Duncan um, uh, was wondering who's the body that's actually driving the study um, and just comments that it, it is great study looking to the future and the expansion of the area. 
Sorry, John, you're going to mute there again. Sorry, Ron, didn't want to cut across you there. Sorry, I'm going to mute. Um, yeah, just answering that question, I suppose, in terms of the study, obviously, it's been driven by FTT as a business, um, probably because I, 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 I see huge potential in it for us as a business as well. It, it allows people to be engaged and get educated, but also from the personal point of view, trying to deliver good outcomes for the region is important to me. Um, I think I mentioned at the start, the, the Department of Climate Change and Environment have, have funded us as part of Just Transition. So they're, they're effectively commissioned the study. In terms of who um, our stakeholders are, probably the big ones for me are the local community, you know, um, as, as, as much as anybody else. But it's also very important that, that, that we feed into the Just Transition process. Um, so hopefully that answers that. Absolutely. Um, next question there, I, I, wonder, I was kind of wondering myself, um, you had mentioned um, mealworms and duckweed and um, Peter, I was just wondering what, what, what duckweed is used for. Yeah, I'm not going to confess to be an expert on duckweed protein. I've, I've leaned a lot on, on the work stream leaders um, in terms of pulling, pulling all this together so they could kind of give, give some of this, these more detailed answers. But my understanding is that uh, the duckweed protein is potential, has a number of potential uses. Animal feed is one in particular where it could be used. That's fair enough. Um, uh, comment rather than a question of Project Sheehan just uh, said very impressive, thank you. Um, uh, we've questioned there, um, I suppose, it's still in in in, in uh, mid-flow, but uh, just wondering what the, the, the lessons learned so far, is there anything that you personally have taken out of it? Um, I suppose the lessons learned I think communication is very important. It's probably one of the big lessons. It's the more you look at the region and all the interdependencies and all the stakeholders, it's very important to try and talk to as many people as possible and don't end up operating in the silo. Um, we're, we've been fortunate enough um, that that we've been working well with Longford County Council and we've been aware of kind of what they've been doing. There have been instances where I've had um, consultations with, with, with people who have been doing really interesting stuff and I had no idea they were doing a study and they had no idea I was in a study. Um, and it was good fortune that we tended to, um, uh, to, to, to cross paths. Um, so it's a lesson learned. It's maybe it's, it's, it's something that maybe could, could feed into the just transition process in terms of maybe having forums where there could be idea sharing, you know, and, and making sure that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. I think there's huge value to be, to be um, gleaned from that. You know? yes, yeah. Um, I, I suppose just on that, I, I don't know if you're aware, um, we had a, a lecture recently from Stevie Donnelly from uh, IT Sligo, and they're looking at a study on having a local gas network. Um, again, kind of energy, high energy users within the within the town and um, I suppose servicing them initially and, you know, the talks of, of the likes of um, anaerobic digestion then feeding into that but i suppose initially using you know liquid natural gas or 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 or, or, or similar um um so uh just next question there um uh michael duffy uh, has micro hydro generation been considered a number of weirs on the channel could be used to harness the energy uh, and perhaps hydrogen generation plants could be coupled with these Possibly, I have to confess, it's not something we've looked at yet. We probably looked at the wind resource by virtue of the scale of it. It's it's, it's probably orders of magnitude um, larger than what you'd achieve from the river. Um, yeah. So that that's really why why we've been looking there. I think I think there's great opportunity potentially um, putting some form of energy storage, whether it's hydrogen or long duration energy storage. Um, I don't know how it would work from a from a from a regulation point of view, but having that behind the, behind the meter on a wind farm would mean that all the electricity from the wind farm um, that went into that energy store, once that energy store discharged back into the grid, it's legitimately zero carbon energy coming back out of that store. That wouldn't necessarily be the case for every every energy store, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, just something that occurred to me there, just uh, given that, I suppose the primary aim here is 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 to be of, of benefit to the community in that. Um, is is there a potential there for micro generation in general, or is it is it kind of more focused on, as you said, kind of larger wind farms? I think I think there is probably potential for micro generation. To date, we've been looking at the larger one. I suppose one thing I forgot to mention about that longer duration storage. What I liked about it personally, and this is as somebody from the area, there was more employment. 
um, with with technologies like that compared to the batteries. So yeah. you you would need it would be a multi year construction project. You would need more than a hundred people to build it. And once it was built, you're probably talking to ten or fifteen people to run that plant, yeah. um, which is you know much more employment than you would get from maybe a a, a battery storage plant, which um, and also potentially the waste heat as well. You know. Um, another question there uh, is this study setting a precedent or have similar studies been done in the past with successful outcomes yeah I'm not sure <laughs> to be honest um, I'd, like to, I'd like to think we're setting somewhat of a precedent probably for, for, for the Lockery area um, but um, I know there has been a lot of good work done before on, in, in other areas nationally like Lachine Mines for example the National Bioeconomy Campus that was set up down there there was a lot of good work done in, in terms of getting that set up so we're probably not the first, but um, there probably aren't too many studies being run by private companies, I suppose, looking at things at a regional level, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose it might be a bit of a following question, but uh, somebody asks, uh, do you think there's potential for a similar study to be carried out in the Money Point region? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I've, one, of my, one of my very first ideas here when I when I, when I wrote to the government was, could you put in thermal energy storage on the power plant sites? So could you basically heat up molten salt or hot rock and generate steam from that? Um, you know, maybe maybe the time has passed for that in terms of the Midlands, but we still have a lot of um, fossil fuel plants. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in Germany on that. I think they, they basically call these um, these thermal plants, thermal storage plants, they're called Carnot batteries. So looking at basically, uh, retrofitting these onto the back end of fossil fuel plants. So potentially money point could be they could be there. Hydrogen and money point obviously is another one giving us proximity to the to the to the to the coast, I would guess, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, probably worth Rory Monaghan actually uh, from from anyway Galway is looking at is looking at something like that in the in in, in the money point region. It's probably worth looking at that. Okay. Um uh, question there which possibly is 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 the is somewhat of a follow up to your your previous point about the creation of employment, but uh, how will success be measured and monitored in the the Lockery region? Will it be creating jobs, impacting the environment, any pro energy production indicators? Etc. I think the main the main the main criteria that we want to satisfy is that it has economic benefits to the region, environmental benefits to the region, um, and social benefits to the region as well. So whatever we do should try and be positive in terms of all three of those. In terms of trying to measure those, not the easiest thing in the world to do, but um, we can we can maybe see what comes out of the out of the details assessments and then um, score them on that basis probably to see which of them score most strongly against those three three criteria. And if they have a negative impact on any any three of them, they probably don't get pro progress then. That's, that's fair enough. Um... Uh, so, uh, next question. Um, with the hemp you mentioned, uh, would that be mainly used for producing CBD or for fuel? That probably, yeah, we're probably not at a stage in the study where we know. Um, it's, uh, we know that there's probably an opportunity and we're at the, we're at the stage now where we're going to kind of quantify what that is. Um, ideally, you would have more than one, one use of it, though, you know, you'd be looking to maximise the use of the crop, all, all, all parts of it, ideally, you know. Um, uh, Darius there asked a question. Uh, what about willow trees? Uh, I'm not sure. The exact yeah, I think we, we talked about that in terms of the tariff action. So again, that's an area we're looking at. Um, I didn't mention in the presentation we have had a uh, we, we had some pretty good good uh, contact with uh, Barry Caslin in in Chagas, who's their sustainability lead. He's actually based in Strokeston. And, He's from Strokes and originally in Centre of Scotland, so he's, he's got an interest in the region. So he's helping us there in terms of seeing what's suitable from a from a land mapping point of view, which soils are, are the best for, for which, yeah. you know, what's good for hemp, what's good for willow, what's good for alternatives. Okay. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, he's been very, very helpful there. Very good. Um... So I was kind of with the audience questions. I, I might just, out of my own curiosity, you had kind of uh, discussed with the uh, liquid air option. I wonder, would you would you just kind of give a brief, brief outline of that again? I, I I'm not sure I understood the. Yeah, so that's the technology. If, if you imagine you have excess wind on the grid and you can't send, there's nobody, you know, you get excess wind on the grid. Your demand is say five gigawatts, and you're you've got potentially six gigawatts on the grid. Yeah. 
um, you can maybe export that through the interconnector, but potentially there's always situations where there's more than you can export. Yeah. So the liquid air technology would take that electricity, that electricity would drive a compressor. So it would pull air out of the atmosphere, compress that air um, to a very high pressure. Um, then it, it would, uh, you would reject the heat then and, and store that heat basically in, 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 in rock effectively. Yeah. Um, and then you would liquefy that using a liquefaction plant, effectively mechanical refrigeration. Um, so you have the air stored in liquid form in tanks uh, that can sit there for weeks, months, right? Uh, yeah. And the amount of storage you can you can have is only limited by the number of tanks you have. Yeah. Uh, so if you want a lot of long duration storage, you want it to run for hours, one hours, then more tanks. Um, so so, so then, it could, could yeah. it be set up in a modular? Way yeah, that's... yeah, that's what I liked about it. I had a pretty open mind in all this stuff. We, we we undertook a kind of a literature survey where we looked at probably a dozen different long duration energy storage technologies. Liquid air wasn't the one I actually thought was was was, was the best at the start, but it has shown to be the most potential in my opinion. Um, so you basically take that liquid air then and you you expand it through a turbine. The turbine makes the electricity, but the heat that you stored to compress it in the first place is what you use to convert it from liquid back into gas. And are there are there existing plants? Yeah, there's or... a number of there's a number of suppliers doing it. There's there's um there's a there's a number of I think it's a five megawatt plant in the UK, and I think they're increasing now to a uh, two hundred. I'll get the number wrong here, but it's about fifty megawatt plant I think being built near Manchester that oh. stores about eight hours of energy. So it's about 400 yeah. megawatt hours. It's that kind of scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's meant to, to kind of fill in gaps. So, I mean, that's probably, you know, while it might be eight hours of continuous, it'll probably, you know, over a period of a couple of days or a week or something, it'll probably fill in, you know, various dips, you know, so. Yeah, and to my mind, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a clean alternative to a peaker plant. So instead of kind of firing up a plant on natural gas or on diesel, to meet a, a short a shortfall in, in, in peak generation, a plant like that gives you the same, it gives you the same spinning power that you would get from a from a conventional uh, turbine type plant, you know. Okay. Um, so while I was talking to you there, uh, a, a, a few other people have have asked questions. So uh, we've four more and look, I'll, I'll I'll take these and and we might wrap up then. Um, so uh, is there a risk uh, to all these potential energy storage projects in Ireland caused by the Celtic interconnector between Ireland and France? Um, I think probably somebody from, from Airgrid or <laughs> ESP could probably answer that question better, but my understanding is that um, the answer is probably no. If you look at government policy in terms of offshore wind, we're going to have more electricity than we can, than we can probably deal with, you know? So, so we're 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 looking to use that for export rather than than importing. Well, I think even even if you fill all of that, that in terms of interconnectors, I think you're still going to have a surplus. You know. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, what have been the challenges in implementing this change process, and how did you overcome them? Uh, is there government policy support? Um. But I suppose we haven't implemented yet. I suppose yeah, it's still in the yeah. the study phase. Yeah. Um, and I guess it, it, it is it is actually coming from government policy. Yeah, um, that's fair enough. I'll, I'll move on from that fella. Um, uh, okay. Um, um, I understand the uh, very informative presentation. I understand there was a similar study centered around the road plant in Offaly. Yeah, I think so. I might got this wrong, but I think it was, it was a project Electra, I think. I know. As part of this study, um, we've actually, FCT have joined the Irish Energy Storage Association to kind of, um, there's a number of people on that who are very, very knowledgeable, including some people who are working on the Lum Clune project as well. Um, uh, Peter Duffy is also uh, a member of that. Peter would, would be a, a, an engineer who worked in the in the ESB power plant in, in Lanesborough a number of years back and has good, good knowledge of the area and has given a lot of really good advice to us over the course of the study. Um, so. Yeah, if, if we've talked a little bit about it and what's going on in Offaly, and we'll probably talk more about that as the study goes on. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so um, last question. Um, I suppose uh, technology clusters are often you know, located with educational bodies. Um, and I suppose this person, I think you might have mentioned that they're, they're asking if at Lone IT. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we have. We've had some engagement with, with at Lone IT with uh, Professor Neil Rowan there. And uh, we're, we're probably going to have more engagement as we as we get more meat on the bones of some of these ideas. We'll, we'll be re-engaging them as well, you know. Um, so look, um, that was the the, the last uh, question there. Um, look, there's, there's there's been great engagement tonight. Um, you know, I think we've we've had. I think I saw kind of eighty plus people online. So obviously, people are very interested in it, and you know, it was a broad topic. And I, I suppose one of the benefits of you know the the, the online platform is that we can. Have, a, have a, somebody like yourself come and talk to us and can talk about, uh, you know, a project that's that's not necessarily Cork based. So we're absolutely delighted to 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 have you with us uh, tonight, John. Um, I think the the number of questions and the diversity of the questions show the the interest and the engagement with with with, with your lecture. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, we can't ask the audience to give you a round of applause as we traditionally would, but. I can assure you from the, the comments that are coming in from my own um, you know, viewing of the lecture, it was very, very interesting. And um, we look forward to perhaps maybe um, someday inviting you back to, 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 to talk to us about you know, the, the, the implementation of, of, of some of the aspects of the, of the study. Yeah, hopefully that'll be, that'll, be, that'll be great. And yeah, thanks everybody on, on, on the line for uh, taking the time out on Wednesday evening. So. To, to listen to me, that's appreciated. Absolutely. Um, so look, folks, um, just quickly before I wrap up, uh, just to let you know, um, the Cork Region's next lecture is next Tuesday. Uh, so that's on the installation of large monopoles for wind energy. And then in the current uh, sustainability grand tour series of which this lecture is a part, uh, our colleagues in the West Region hosting a lecture on the 24th which will be on sustainable housing uh, so uh, Orla Hegarty um, Professor Orla Hegarty and Hugh Brennan of O'Cluan Housing will be uh, giving that lecture so for those lectures and many of the other lectures that, 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 that are listed there in the sustainable sustainability grand tour series and other lectures from NGOs Ireland if you'd like to log on to the Engineers Ireland website, or you can follow us on um, Twitter and LinkedIn, and you'll find information on upcoming events. So um, with that, I'll, I'll draw the, the, the evening to a close. So once again, from Engineers Ireland in general and Cork region in particular, um, John, thank you. Thank you very much for a very Absolutely. interesting lecture. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see yourself and our, uh, our, our guests online again soon. Okay, so without further ado, we'll uh, draw the evening to a close. Thanks very much.